What's up guys, it's History Boy, and today we're going to be exploring the battles of Fromel and Pazier on this World War I Anzac History app. Now this is part one of what I hope to be a series, so please comment down below and tell me if you did in fact like it and you want me to continue the series. An intro is about to play, which will explain the importance of the battles of Fromel and Pazier, and just set the stage a little bit. So, let's get started with that. In July 1916, the battles of Fromel and Pozier marked Australia's entry onto the Western Front of the Great War. These were two of many battles fought during the Somme Offensive, in which for nearly half of 1916, British and its Dominion soldiers fought alongside their French allies in a bid to break through the Germans' entrenched positions to the north and south of the Somme River. Men in their hundreds of thousands fell on the Somme battlefields, most the victims of dueling artillery and eviscerating machine gun fire. By its end, there were more than a million casualties on both sides. For the Australian Imperial Force, two of these battles would become devastating introductions to war on the Western Front. Where Fromel was a feint in an attempt to deceive the Germans, the ambition at Pozier spoke directly to the principal strategy of the Allied armies, to take high ground held by the German army and force a breakthrough in their front line. Both battles are infamous for the terrible loss of life suffered by the men of the all-volunteer Australian Imperial Force. Today, their sacrifice is remembered as the profound cost of one of the most momentous changes in human history. That was very interesting for me, and I hope that it gave you guys a bit of insight into these battles. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of sections to explore here. We have dioramas and models, photos and video, diaries of some of the soldiers, now narrated, personnel about the equipment, military trees about the chain of command, and podcasts, which we might not get to in this series. In this part, we are exploring both sides' trenches, so let's get started with the English After they first trench. arrived in France, the Australians, especially those who'd served on Gallipoli, found life on the Western Front to be quite comfortable. Cushy job, man. Lodgings were usually close to the front. Army canteens sold food, yeah, tobacco, and warm drinks, pride. and the men could buy champagne, spirits, beer, and food from local bars, cafes, and civilians. Oh, but a very different experience awaited these soldiers in the trenches of the front lines, like hell, where they could only find protection from artillery bombardment, no, machine guns, here. and snipers by remaining below ground, and where they had to endure the danger and fear of nice patrolling no man's land. I get that coming from Gallipoli, this could seem like an easy job, but life in a trench is not Several types of trench existed across the Western Front. This model illustrates a basic main line trench, typical of parts of the British front line at Fromel. Yeah, he went adrift. Trenches of this type were not sunk deep into the ground Where? because of the high water table and were fortified using excavated soil and sandbags. These were known as breastworks. Vertical struts, Wire mesh and packed earth can be seen supporting this structure. Came up from the cab rank. Along the floor run wooden duckboards laid there to keep men and equipment out of the mud and water. Cheero, mate. Soldiers stepped from the duckboards up to the fire step in order to fire over the breastworks. That was interesting because I didn't really know how these kind of trenches were set up. The one thing that I think they could have done better on this diorama is to show more mud, because that stuff would have been everywhere. Let's move on to the next The stage. trench periscope was an optical device used during the First World War to observe the ground in front of the trenches without taking the risk of becoming a target for enemy no, snipers. Take a, take a this, Early trench periscopes were made by installing two mirrors at 45 degree angles at either end of a long box or tube. During the winter of 1914, Soldiers on the front lines began to use these improvised box periscopes, 
also known as hyperscopes. By mid-1916, as the use grew more widespread, British Army workshops behind the front lines started the manufacture of trench periscopes. All right, let's take a look inside one of these trench periscopes. So a lot of dirt, obviously. Um, it's actually a pretty good view. You can see a lot, and you don't have to risk putting your head over the top. See, he's just right behind the sandbag. Unlike this guy, a sniper could just take a pot shot and take his head clean off. But this guy on the other end, he's perfectly fine. All right, let's go to the next. At dawn on Wednesday the 19th of July, nice the British 61st it. and the Australian 5th Division began the move into the trenches of the British front line, love it, ready to attack the 6th Bavarian Reserve Division in their well-entrenched positions to the west of Fromel and Aubert village. From General Haking's note to his troops, Finally, when we've cut all the wire, destroyed all the enemy's machine gun emplacements, knocked down most of his parapet, killed a large proportion of the enemy, and thoroughly frightened the remainder, our infantry will assault, capture, and hold the enemy's support line along the whole front. The objective will be strictly limited to the enemy's support trenches and no more. An Andy Quite a different reality awaited the men later that day. Imagine them just getting up and charging Barbed wire the was top. a primary form of defense in trench warfare especially effective against patrols and infantry assaults. Oh, they're all ragtime Trenches could be haphazardly covered with barbed wire across their open tops, providing a vicious foil to attack. And rows of wire-strewn fence poles were a common sight in front of the trench lines on both sides of no man's land. They're hung on the wire, sir. Once caught up in barbed wire, a soldier could be made a helpless target for enemy fire or could be taken prisoner. Wiring parties were regularly sent out into no man's land at night to repair wire or lay down new barriers. Jeez, your game. Soldiers would drive stakes into the ground using rubber mallets and blankets to muffle the sound and then unspool and string up the wire as quietly well, as possible up in the rest while frequently having to remain completely still when flares intermittently illuminated the landscape or dive for cover if the enemy fired on them. What's your right? Laying a segment of wire under such conditions could take several hours. Imagine getting hung up on that stuff or even just having to lay it out. Nightmare. Okay, now that we're done with the British frontline trench, let's move on to the German frontline trench. Whilst trench systems on both sides of World War I varied dramatically in integrity and complexity, German trenches tended towards being the more complex. Having established frontline systems early in the war, German forces were defending the land they'd seized, whilst Allied forces were faced with attacking these positions. This relationship between the Allied offensive and German defensive characterized the types of trench works employed by each side. The German army had in some areas time to develop exceptionally well entrenched systems, including sophisticated dugouts, communication, and supply trenches and to reinforce these with a range of materials including latticed branches, heavy wooden beams, and metal materials such as corrugated iron. Meanwhile, Allied trenches were more expedient in their design, often dug into the land which soldiers found themselves on. So two very different kinds of trenches. Now it looks as if we're going down In the more developed the trench. trenches on both sides, so-called dugouts varied in complexity. Here, a single room serves as a protected area from artillery bombardment, where soldiers could also sleep and find some vestige of comfort from the otherwise squalid experience of life on the front line. The chalky ground of the Somme Valley supported these dugouts, as it was soft enough to excavate and also sufficiently resilient to withstand shell fire. It doesn't look exactly comfortable, but this guy has his coffee and everything. Looks okay. Ooh, wow, Even though that. dugouts were designed to be sufficiently deep to avoid artillery fire, as the war went on, it could prove safer to abandon the trench and seek shelter in the mass of shell holes in no man's land, for the simple fact that if the enemy knew the position of a trench, they could destroy it with increasing effectiveness. German deployment strategy also developed to keep the majority of troops in the rear trenches, leaving front lines thinly manned, 
preserving lives during artillery barrages. These reserves could then move forward to repel attacks. If that shell had landed just a little bit closer to that kind of nice room, then it would have destroyed it. Frontline trenches were connected with smaller, perpendicular communication trenches that could stretch far back towards the rear areas, functioning to allow the safe passage of men and supplies back and forth to the front lines. Some areas of the front line were also supplied by narrow-gauge push lines, which enabled heavy supplies, including vital stores of ammunition and equipment, to be moved quickly. The narrow gauge systems would eventually connect to the more permanent railway systems to deliver munitions and material over great distances. Communication and supply lines were crucial to the success of an army. That is the truth, and it looks like they can move things up and down this rail system pretty fast, so that's always good. Need those supplies. To the east of the village of Pozier, stretched the so-called Old German Lines, well-prepared and deep trenches with dugouts at regular intervals. They were protected by continuous extended belts of barbed wire, and the Germans had been occupying and improving this position for more than 12 months. When the Australians joined the fighting at Pozier, they were quickly successful in seizing the village. But attempts to capture the Old German Lines on the 23rd of July, and in the days following, proved far more difficult. The protracted attack involved parties of men breaking into the German trenches and bombing their way forward against a skillful enemy well-versed in the defensive qualities of their own trench system. Wow, that barrage just came in heavy. Now let's take a quick 360 look around this trench and, um, you know, just recap on what we learned. So, you know, here's the shell hole they have that nice area where they could seek cover or just hang out there and sip some coffee. And we also have the supply chain because supplies are crucial for the success of an army. 